then she contacted me out of the blue and said that she'd write a book about Ben Orr. So I have to admit that the Cars, although the Cars are one of my favorite bands, and I've loved them since I was 13, um, they weren't on my list of four or five options. Um, so what I did say to her, I go, well, why wouldn't I just write a book about the band as a whole? Or maybe Rick Ocasek. I mean, he's the leader of the band and the main songwriter, so why wouldn't it be one of those options? And she said, just research Ben and see what you think. So that's what I did. Um, I took about a month and I researched Ben's life and I learned all of these really cool things about him. Um, I learned that he was from Cleveland, the home of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so I thought that was cool. start for sure. And, um, and you mentioned a little known fact about Cleveland and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that I, I did not know until you told me this earlier tonight. Yeah. There are only two native Clevelanders who are members of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, Bobby Womack is the first one and Benjamin Orr is the second one. So I thought that was really cool, and then I started investigating his life a little bit, and I found out that um, when he was young, he was a teen star, if you will, in the city. Um, there was a TV show that was based in Cleveland called Upbeat, and it's kind of like the Cleveland version of American Bandstand, where um, they bring in national acts to sing their songs. Um, but the difference with this show was um, they had house bands that would be behind the artists playing as they segued into the commercials and out of commercials. So they, and they would go into the city of Cleveland and find local bands to be the house bands on this show. And at age 17, Ben was uh, the leader of a band called the Grasshoppers. And they were called the Grasshoppers because they hopped around and stayed a lot. <laughs> and they wore green beetle boots. Um, so, uh, his band was one of the house bands on Upbeat. So I'm thinking to myself, there's this 17 year old kid um, and his band is on this TV show that ended up being nationally syndicated in like 80 cities across the country. So it wasn't quite as big as American Bandstand, but it was a big show. And this was a good, at least a decade before the cars, right? Over a decade before he was in the cars. And I'm like, oh my God. And I started interviewing a couple of, um, I've become friends with some of his friends from the early days. And uh, Ben was a rock star from the beginning. At 17, he already knew how to do it. And um, so I just, I learned these things about him and I asked a couple of Cars fans that I knew, nobody knew these things about him. So I, decide, I decided to write about Ben and it had nothing really to do with the Cars, although I love the Cars. That is what hooked me. I wanted to write about something that no one else had written about. You know, how many things can you say about Led Zeppelin or Pink Floyd or the Doors and everyone else has said a million times? Even Cars fans, a lot of Cars fans, didn't know these things about Ben. So that's what hooked me. And that's how I decided to write the biography about Benjamin Moore. Great. Um, you mentioned, of course, that he was a rock star. And I think that's one thing that comes across that everybody in the book refers to, is that he looked great, he had this charisma, you see him on stage, you think this is this is the superstar of the band. How did Ben relate to that? It seemed he didn't always like, have the same experience. And, yeah, you know, and people, people have seen a lot of my interviews or heard them or read articles and stuff. I know I'm kind of repeating myself because there's only one way to explain it, so I know some people here are going to have already heard some of these things. Um, but um, Ben, I describe it as Ben flipped a switch to go on stage and be a rock star. Um, you look at this guy on stage and this good-looking guy dressed to the nines, one of the most iconic voices in rock history. I mean, to me, his voice is right up there with David Bowie and Paul Rogers and Paul McCartney. I mean, Ben's voice is right there to me. That's a lot of people say Elvis in the book when they hear him. He, he loved Elvis. Yeah, he used to sit in his living room when he was like five years old in front of his parents and like imitate Elvis and sing Elvis songs. So he loved Elvis. Um, so you see all you see Ben on stage, um, but he won't. 
he would flip a switch to go on stage and be a rock star, and when he came off stage, he'd turn that switch back off, and he just became a regular guy. He, um, he was very humble, he wasn't into the spotlight. Um, I noticed along the way that like you'd see interviews with the band, and um, he didn't really say much, he'd be in the back. I mean, if, some, if an interviewer asked him a question, he'd answer it, but he wasn't outgoing, if you will. He just kind of stayed in the background. Um, so he was really different off stage. Of course, I never met the man, unfortunately, but all these people I interviewed would tell me these things, how humble he was off stage and how he, you know, he appreciated the fans, though. Um, there's a story in the book where he's with a photographer friend and they're in a mall and a fan noticed him and then another fan noticed him next thing you know he had a whole crowd of people around him wanting an autograph and the photographer told me that he was really impressed because Brooke Ben stayed there and signed every autograph and shook every hand until they were all satisfied before they left the mall. So Ben was really appreciative of his fans and it wasn't just one person who told me that, it was a common thread throughout all the interviews I did, um, which by the way was 120 mm. people are interviewed in this book, so I talked to a lot of people. Okay, um, tell, tell me about some of the people that you wound up uh, unearthing. You, you found a whole lot of people from different stages of Ben's life, different oh, yeah. musical, personal associates. Yeah, I mean, from family members to kids he went to elementary school and junior high school with, um, bandmates from his early bands. So a lot of people I talked to before he became famous to get that kind of perspective on him. And then after he became famous, I mean, obviously, two members of the of the Cars um, were gracious enough to be a part of my book, uh, David Robinson and Greg Hawks. They were both very kind and gracious to me. Um, but you know, other people like um, record executives, rock photographers, I mean, a lot of different people I talked to, and um, they all had the same sort of common themes about Ben. Whether it was somebody who knew him when he was 12, or it was somebody who knew him after he became a rock star. He was the same kind of person. And uh, it's, a, it's a really amazing thing. Yeah, you think there's not a lot of shocking things you can learn about the personal life of a rock star, but to learn that he lived in Vermont, was into like hunting and fishing, I mean, how shocking is that? I know, I told you that on the ride down, you were like, what? No, that can't be true. Oh well, yeah, he lived an hour from me in Vermont. How ironic is that? Yeah. Um, and you know, the interview process was really, like people have asked me like, where did you find all these people? And I had a short list of people to interview, but I tell you, it is amazing how many people a freaking rock star knows. <laughs> I mean, I could still be doing interviews now. I could do interviews until I died, and I wouldn't talk to everybody. Rock stars know so many people. Um, but I would interview somebody, and they would go, so, have you talked to so-and-so? No, I haven't talked to them. Who's that? Oh my God, you gotta talk to so and so. Here's his number. And I call that person, and they could be three or four people to talk to, and then and it just went on and on and on and on. And eventually, as people started finding out about the book, I had people coming to me. I had to kind of decipher who to talk to. I mean, there's some people I talked to that didn't even end up in the book because the thing could have been war and peace if I kept going. I mean, I, really, I tell people I have enough information where I could probably do a second book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so and you also yeah. found both of the women he was married to, right? Talked to you for the book. Yes, I talked. I interviewed the, the significant people in Ben's life. Yes. Um, uh, Those must have been quite emotional interviews. So. Yeah, they really were, and I thank them all for um, opening up their personal lives to me. And without mentioning names. Um, I, I get the feeling that I had to gain the trust of a couple of them. They didn't necessarily say, sure, Joe, I'll talk to you. What do you want to know? <laughs> didn't quite work out that way, which is totally understandable. And another thing I'll say about my interviews with Ben, there were a, it wasn't just the significant women in his life, um, friends and family. There were a lot of people that, if I 
If I, if somebody said no to me for an interview and I just gave up, there would have, wouldn't have been a lot of people in this book. Um, I had to be persistent because they knew Ben was a private person, um, and they wanted to um, preserve his legacy, if you will. So they were really concerned about what I was going to write about him. Like, who are you? You know, how do I know what you're going to write about this man? I mean, these people really cared about him. Um, so I had to gain a lot of people's respect um, and trust before they would talk to me. And that, I mean, I joke about it taking a decade to put this thing together, but there actually were reasons why. Um, it, it, the interview process um, itself took a long time. And I would do interviews with people, and they would want to see. Like, I'd do an interview, I'd get their answers, I'd turn it into quotes, I'd put it in the manuscript, but then they would say, I want to see what you wrote. What did I say? And I'd show it to them, and they'd go, change this, change this, add that, send it back to me. And I'd make the changes, and we'd go back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. So it wasn't like writing it down, putting it in, boom, it's done. I did interviews that took months um, to get right. And, but in the end, I'm glad I did it that way. There were no surprises. Um, thank God I haven't had anybody come back to me and I can't believe you wrote that. I didn't say that to you because all these people I interviewed pretty much knew what was going to be in the book already. So I'm really glad it ended up being that way. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, evidence in the book and a lot of people talking about what a nice down to earth guy Ben was, but the one story that really brought that home to me uh, was the one about playing with the uh, uh, Captain Swing playing with the Atlantis. That to me, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's fit for a family audience, but it certainly brought home to me how, uh, <laughs> how, how good a guy this was. Let's say that one of the one of the Atlantic's roadies might have taken a couple of liberties on the guitar case of the uh, of, of Captain Swing. Yeah. Um, they didn't like the band or whatever the strange reason was. Um, did something really horrible did something not nice. to the band. And um, you know what? He felt horrible about it, though. And, um, and that just said, no problem, man. I understand. Yeah, where most people would like want to punch you in the face <laughs> or do something to that effect. Um, ben was cool as a cucumber and said, hey, no problem. It's just easy going about it. And um, yeah, that's surprising that. I had to think about that for a minute, actually. Now, you got to remember, you know how long it took me to do this thing, so. <laughs> that was an interesting one, though, for sure. <laughs> and uh, you also talked about how, how exacting he was at the studio. He seemed to be someone that took it very seriously when he was doing the vocal. You mentioned that he'd, do, uh, he'd record some of the songs like four times, take the best pieces of those four four tracks and put them together, and then do it four more times and take all the pieces of those together. And had that, this, that's real devotion. A process of doing it. You know what, though? On the other end of the spectrum, um, I learned this when I interviewed David. Um, Ben was like Frank Sinatra in a way that um, he would, they would be in the studio and he'd be waiting around, smoking a cigarette, waiting to do his vocal take. And he'd be like, okay, Ben, we're ready for you. And he'd be like, okay. And he'd put the cigarette down and he'd walk in there and he'd do it in one take, done. And then leave. And do you want me to do it again? No, I don't need to do it again. I mean, you know, some artists will have to do it. They'll want to do it. Oh, if I can do it better than that, I can do it better than that. And um, I think it's funny, like, when David was telling me about it, he was like, yeah, I'm ready to go. And, like, he wasn't even, like, warming up or doing anything. He was just standing there, and David would be like, what do you mean you're ready to do it? You're ready to do this? And sure enough, go in there, one take, boom, and it'd be done. And David also said that they got used to recording with Ben like that. One take kind of guy. <laughs> that's pretty amazing. That's that's definitely like Sinatra like. So ha having done all this, like, do you hear the Cars music can be differently now that you know all the ins and outs of it? Wow, we were talking about this. Um, I, I, no, talk, I, we're talking about it as in nobody has asked me that yet. If you do enough interviews about something, you pretty much hear all the questions, but you did it. <laughs> yeah. That has not, so I have to think about that a minute. You know, I don't think I do. I don't think I look at the music any, I love it just as much as I always did. And I'm like trying to think, I don't know, 
I don't, I don't look at it any differently, even though I know so much about Ben now and about the band. I don't, you know, people say, well, people ask me to describe the cars. What, do you, what genre are they? What do you describe them as? And you really can't pigeonhole the cars. Um, they've been called a rock band. They've been called a uh, punk band, just because of the connection to the rat. You know, when they were there, a lot of punk bands were playing there. But a rock band, a punk band, a pop band, a new wave band. Um, and I don't think they're any one of those things. I think they're a little bit of all of that wrapped into one. They have such a unique sound. And you know, when a car song comes on the radio, you know it's them. You know what I mean? And I think that's why their music has lasted so long. And I just heard a radio commercial today um, that had a car song in the yeah. background. Yeah. Um, so, you know, 40 years on, and here I am on stage talking about them. And, you know, they're still relevant. And um, I just think they're such a unique band. But to answer your question, I really don't think I look at it any differently. That's cool. Uh, yeah. Well, one, thing, one thing I didn't know enough about was all the music Ben got into after the cards. And your mm -hmm. book does a real good job of uh, laying that all out, because there were all these demos that were made, some of which came out a lot, a lot of which did. Yeah. And he toured with a couple of other like all-star bands. Right. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people don't know so much about that stuff because Although he put out a solo album in the 80s, The Lace, um, he never put out another solo album or an official release um, after the cars were no longer. So that's probably part of it is that no official release came out. But you know what? The thing that was cool, I mean, Ben was a person who, he knew what he wanted to do in life from a very young age. There was no other option. I'm going to be in a national band, that's what they used to say when he was young. It's all he ever wanted to do. Um, he was devoted to it, and I mean, how many people do you know? I mean, I was in my 30s, I still don't think I knew what I wanted to do, um, but Ben knew from the very beginning what he wanted to do, and uh, he saw it through, and went all the way to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I guess he was pretty successful, huh? Yeah. <laughs> We got to hear about this from you because I can I can maybe hold it over you that I got to see the cars a couple times with them but you were at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame when the dad was inaugurated right? so you've got to tell me how that was. Uh, yeah, how that I, sound. I said earlier how um, I think I said it earlier. I, sometimes my interviews get kind of mixed up, um, but yeah, I, when they were in their heyday, I never saw them live. I, you know, it was the mid '80s. I was going to concerts and stuff. I don't know if it was just a timing thing. I know you saw the cars. I was always mad at you for seeing the cars, Andy. <laughs> well, not mad, jealous. How's that? <laughs> um, I never, I never saw them live. Um, but I guess technically that's not the right answer now because yeah, um, Donna. My public relations coordinator and I um, went to Cleveland and saw the band get inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And fortunately, ben, Benjamin couldn't be a part of it, but um, I did. I did get to see them perform, and it was a thrilling time to be there. And even though my book wasn't out yet when I went for the Rock and Roll induction, I did have a book deal at the time, so I was able to go there and start to promote the book. And I did some interviews, and I was on a local TV station, a Fox TV station, and did an interview which I don't mind telling you scared the crap out of me. Yeah. Um, but um, it was a really great experience, and I'm so thankful that I was able to do that. Great. And uh, let's let's open this up to questions. We don't, we're, not, we're not letting you off the hook just yet. <laughs> so uh, maybe if we put a little bit of light on so you can see uh, if there's any hands coming up in the crowd. And uh, what, what have you always wanted to know about the end of the cars? This guy probably knows it. All right. Oh man. So let me premise that by saying um, I didn't interview Rick, I didn't talk to Rick. Um, you know, I can only go on things I've like researched and stuff. Um, and you know, I don't know, if a band breaks up, there's obviously issues. I mean, it, it's obvious. You know what, though? Um, they loved each other. 
Um, I talked about Ben early in his life, um, being in bands, you know, in the Cleveland area. Well, Rick is originally from the Baltimore area, but when he was young, his family moved to Columbus, I believe, um, or the Cleveland area. And Ben and Rick were playing in different bands, but a lot of the same types of venues, and they knew who each other were. Um, and then they eventually came together, and um, the first time, well, the first time they got together and played music together, um, Ben picked up an acoustic guitar and sang a Beatles song, and Rick is quoted as saying it was the most beautiful voice he ever heard in his life. And they became partners right then, and they stayed that way. So, you know, it's like anyone who has brothers and sisters, I mean, you love them and they go through stuff too. It's just the way it is. Um, but, I, you know, in the end, they had a very good working relationship because, um, you know, uh, Rick wrote all the lyrics to all the songs, um, but I really believe that Ben was okay with that. You know what I mean? He just, you write the songs and I'll sing them. And, um, you know, so it's hard for me to get into a lot of detail about it because obviously I never got to talk to either one of them about it, so it's like speculation to say it. But all I know is if you can meet each other that early in life, and I mean, they were on the road together playing dive bars for a decade before the cars were the record deal. So if you're going to go through all that stuff together, I pretty much think you like each other somehow. So, you know, I, I think they had a good relationship. I really do. Anybody else? That one? Come on, speak chance. Here we go. Very fast cars. I think. Oh, but I think the very last person to be the one on the DVD, how soon before Ben's death was that? I, it was it was a very short time. I think we we are talking about a couple of months, I believe. You know, when I go to answer this, there's a couple of different answers, and I know there are some pretty heavy-duty cars and Ben fans out here that might say, well, I don't know about that, Joe. <laughs> um, you know, but one thing I, I, I also did not know before reading the book was that that same night after doing that interview, he flew off and played his last gig. Yeah, he, um, he was with the band Big People at the end, and they had already booked a tour um, to go on the road when Ben was diagnosed. And the other, I interviewed all the members of the Big People Band, and they all, like, as soon as Ben was diagnosed, obviously they were devastated, and at the same time, they said, well, there goes our tour. Not that that was the most important thing, of course. Ben was number one. Um, they all loved him so much. But they figured, okay, that's it, we're done. Ben said, no way, I am gonna go on stage and I am gonna rock until I can't rock anymore. And when I fall over, put me in a wheelchair and I'll keep singing, because that's what he loved to do. And they continued touring. Um, they did a show on the West Coast. He flew cross country to do that last interview with the band. Um, I mean, he was on like an oxygen tank by this time. I mean, he was really weak, not feeling well. But he went and flew across the country, did that interview, and then immediately flew back to the West Coast to do another show. And um, I also want to add, I, um, a, a good friend of his from back in Cleveland, who they were in the Grasshoppers together, his name is Wayne Weston, mm -hmm. um, he, he like refused to believe when he heard that Ben was diagnosed, because he's like, he's the toughest guy I ever knew, um, he never missed a gig, he never had a cold, he never got sick, he never complained, all of that stuff. He like, it's a while for it to sink in with him. And someone else I interviewed at the end of his life said that um, before Ben passed, he was mad because there was one show left on the tour yeah. that he didn't get to do. And believe it or not, that was the first gig he had ever missed in his whole life. He did, he had never missed a gig. And I mean, he's literally lying on his deathbed and he's saying, I'm pissed off, I'm missing that last show. Mm -hmm. I mean, music was his life. 
So to be in a band since you were 13 years old and go through your whole life, I mean, not even like being sick, but just life circumstances, you know? I mean, how could you do that? He never missed again his whole life until the very last one. So he rocked until the end. He really did. Well, of course, if you don't have the book, go get one out there. And speaking of the car's music, you're about to hear it played extremely well by, by this, uh, by moving and stirring. say something about moving the stereo. Um, I've done three events. I started one in Bells Falls, Vermont, the town I live, local bookstore there, to kind of get my feet wet a little bit because I'm green in this whole thing still. And then I went, I wanted to do my next one in Cleveland, Ben's hometown, so I went to Cleveland and did it there. And uh, moving in stereo um, played at my Cleveland event. And um, Donna and I were so impressed with them. I mean, we become friends with them, too. Um, these, they're really great guys, so it's not just having a great band come play, they're our friends, too. And um, we agreed then, you know, I told them I still wanted to do a Boston event, and they said, we want to come to Boston. We haven't been to Boston yet. Um, we love Ben, we love this event you did, and when you do Boston, let us know, we want to come. And they came, so we'll be in stereo, too. A tribute band before, and you walked away going, That wasn't that great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're playing a Led Zeppelin song, but you don't really sound like Led Zeppelin. I tell you what, you close your eyes, man, these guys sound like the cars. I mean, they are an incredible band. I'm so glad you I just love what they do. They're gonna get up on stage and they're just gonna let it fly and then they're gonna pressure with that. I got pressure because I'm up here doing this. <laughs> These guys are used to being on stage, yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you everybody. So many cars fans are here. Welcome to people here. The corruptors are here, and I just I can't um, I can't even explain how it makes me feel. So I love you all. Thank